This episode is sponsored by Body Dynamics. And as you guys already know, there's no better time than the present to start supplementing your nutrition to help fight against poor health. At Body Dynamics, they provide third-party tested supplements such as the Mega Nutritional Vitamins, Total Digestion Probiotic, CBD Oil, and that's just to name a few. They have a ton of stuff on their website. They have a lot of different supplements to check out for your different needs. They have testimonials. They have reviews. They have videos with information on it. It's a great website. Just go to bodydynamics.com right now to check it out. And to make it even better, all listeners of the Rock Savages podcast will receive a 10% discount on all of your purchases when you enter the coupon code ROCK at checkout. R-O-C-K at checkout. Again, enter coupon code ROCK to receive 10% off of your order. And start down a better road to health today. Hey, everybody. It is episode 75 of the Rock Savages podcast. As always, you guys can follow us on rocksavagepod.com. Also, we are on all of the major podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and many others. So check us out wherever you would listen to your favorite podcasts. And now that that's out of the way, this episode features our interview with the legendary record producer, John Custer. He is best known for his work with the long-running rock and roll band Corrosion of Conformity. And we've talked about COC on this show many times. We are obviously huge fans. The first time I saw Corrosion of Conformity was in 1994 at the rock club The Odeon in Cleveland, in the flats, you know, and... uh, I remember just being blown away by this band. You know, I I had purchased Deliverance. It was a, a new album at the time. I think they were on tour with Megadeth and then doing headlining shows in between or directly after that tour, if I'm not mistaken. So that was around that time frame. Uh, I was a lifelong fan after that. I, you know, they they won me over immediately, and I have seen them live several times. I mean. It's probably countless, maybe 10 times now. Uh, I just recently saw the band at the Beachland Ballroom in Cleveland. I believe it was two years ago. might have been a year ago now. Shit gets a little foggy these days, but uh, all the shows and stuff that we see. And and we've seen them so many times over the years. We have a lot of good memories with uh, Corrosion and Conformity. Kind of grew up with the guys, you know? And uh, that kind of music... You know, when you when you listen to a band like Corrosion, it, they stick with you forever. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, any music you listen to as a kid, it's kind of like a time machine. So you kind of go back and you, you relive the memories, and because the music never changes, so it's uh, I you know I I feel bad for people who don't have that kind of thing in their life. Like everything I've ever listened to, I still listen to to this day. You know, so um, it was uh, it was really cool to be able to sit down with John and talk about the work he's done with these guys because it's been such a big part of my life and the lives of many of my friends over the years. So uh, he's a really interesting cat. He's worked with uh, a band called Cry of Love. He is currently working with a band called Big Something, who is uh, they are on their way to you know becoming a, a pretty big band. So um, he's Grammy-nominated. Yeah, he just recently received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Carolina Music Awards for his work with uh, Corrosion, and I'm sure uh, his other body of work as well. He was also um, the producer for Corrosion's latest record called No Cross or No Crown, which has been out for a couple years now, and it is honestly, it just picks up right where the last record with Pepper left off. It's It just fits right into the... Uh, to the catalog it's great it does not disappoint i recommend it go get it if you haven't listened to it yet and uh check all of their records out man i mean you're missing out if you haven't heard corrosion of conformity we go through john's uh career with corrosion 
from the beginning till up till the present. You know, we talk about the recent passing of their longtime drummer, Reed Mullen. And we talk about the coronavirus situation down in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, all of that stuff. So we hope you guys dig it. It was a really fun conversation. It was a thrill for me to sit down and talk with this guy. And uh, he's very interesting. He has a lot of cool stories. And uh, we hope you dig it. So without further ado, we'll just get into this episode. It's episode 75 of the Rock Savages podcast with John Custer. Hey, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that the Rock Savages podcast is now an affiliate of Caveman Coffee. And if you don't already know, one of the owners is athlete and actor Tate Fletcher, who has been seen many times on the Joe Rogan Experience and happens to have his own podcast as well called Pirate Life Radio, available now on Apple Podcasts. These guys are single-sourced, hand-picked, and small-batch roasted and source all of their beans from one family farm in Colombia. All products from Caveman Coffee are certified paleo and keto. And right now, listeners of the Rock Savages podcast can go check them out at cavemancoffeeco.com. That is cavemancoffeeco.com. And receive 15% off your order at checkout by entering the code ROCK. So we hope you guys dig it and support small business. Hello. Hey, hello. Hey, it's Custer. Hey, John. How's it going, man? Well, it's going, you know, plenty, yeah. plenty going on. Oh, <laughs> that is correct. Uh, it, hey, this is Bo from the Rock Savages podcast. Huge fan of yours. Yeah. Huge fan of your work, man. Thanks for taking the call today. It's pretty, uh, sure. it's pretty big deal for me and for us. First of all, how's everything going down there and you're in rally? <sighs> Uh, it's, it's all right. You know, they, uh, they show the footage from Italy and, you know, other places and, um, everybody here, they've already stopped, uh, having bar service or uh, restaurant service and all of that. So, <clears throat> you know, it's the next 15 days, I guess they'll see how that behaves. Yeah, they've done the same here, so it's very. There's a, there's already a doctor who was reported tonight on the news that uh, cured himself of it using a kind of an old Ebola um, drug, and they reported him on the news, and they're already sending that drug off to be tested and that kind of thing. But um, you know. None of that is, uh, none of that is expedited really to the point that, you know, you're talking about anything in the next couple of weeks, but at least they reported him, you know, that's, he's out in the national conscience, you right. know, right. they, they can't, they can't, it's not like anybody's going to forget that guy. Right. They're going to definitely, definitely follow up and say, want to know what those results are yeah i think uh vaccines always take quite a bit of time to develop i just wish they would have uh gotten it together a little bit sooner like they should have known i mean they've known about this stuff for a while now they should have been on it you know, yeah cdc man i mean it's just why are you guys dragging your feet you know gee it's uh it's just very bizarre like to see this in american life and culture i don't think any of us have ever seen anything like this i mean have you i mean i haven't uh no no you, sometimes you hear references to the day after 9-11 when everybody acted you know like we were all brethren and that kind of thing yeah and that it was a shame that it took something like that to get that dynamic in play sure yeah i mean i i agree um i think i think most people get along just fine they're just pockets here and there that can be kind of a problem but it's good at least to see people pulling together you know when times get tough you know um and you know just for posterity i, <laughs> I just did an interview with uh kyle shut from the sword and we had to say the same thing but um 
just for posterity, this is in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, just for anybody who's listening in the future. So that's what we're talking about today. So, um, so how is, uh, how's rally otherwise, man? I mean, there's no, uh, there, there's no really confirmed cases or. <clears throat> Here in North Carolina. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, 41 cases now. Jeez. In North, geez, that's not. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, maybe, yeah. we'll, maybe we'll just get through it. You know, this might not be so bad. <clears throat> I think West Virginia is, uh, maybe West Virginia is the only place that they don't have any cases, but I'm not. I mean, it changes every five minutes, so. Right, right. yeah. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on it, I guess. Hope for the best, man, for sure, you know? Mm-hmm, yeah. How's everything else otherwise, man? What do you what have you been up to lately? I you know, I know um uh, I know about your career with Corrosion of Conformity and Cry of Love and, and Dag, of course. Um I guess, you know, uh, what I I, I want to know about you, man. Like prior to all those guys, I mean, how did you get started in the music business? How did you I, I know you were a, a musician, correct? So how yeah. did, how did you transition from, from musician to producer? How did you develop the skill set for recording? Well, when I started playing in bands and all that. I I think I was 19, probably 19 and 20. And we were going around playing colleges in kind of the southeastern United States. Drinking age was 18. The bars and the clubs were gigantic. You know, you'd play to 700, 1,000 people a night. That was just a common thing. And um, they raised the drinking age when we were only, I guess we, we had only played about two years. And they raised the drinking age. All the bars, all the clubs, everything just stopped. They all shut down. And that entire industry just vanished. And um, they were just worried about kids getting killed on the roads, you know, um, basically. But I... uh at the end of all of that, I um, started recording at home on a real early, early recorder. Oh, wow. Um, it was a cassette format. You got right. four tracks, that right. kind of thing. And my recording started getting around, um, you know. Uh, and so people started to come to me and say, hey, why don't you you know, record us. And so I started to collaborate with other people and record other people, work with them that way. And since I was a musician, I was uh, able to be empathetic um, to a musician in the studio. I know how the pressure is. Right. And all of that. So um, I had a natural advantage of, uh, of collaboration getting along with people because I had been in their shoes and it was a, a, a much more artistic approach than a technical approach where they just kind of throw you in there and they record what you do, but there's no real pushing the equation to take it to the next level kind of thing. Right. 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 So that's what I kind of got, um, known for uh so to speak and so uh more and more and more people came to me and i went to new york to become a session guitar player there was a kind of legendary scoring studio in new york called vision sound studios and there was a a composer there who became one of my mentors and he was they were the number one scoring house in the country they were doing Every major commercial you saw on television was probably them. (laughs) And so uh, every guitar player in New York was trying to get in there, right? And get, get gigs and everything. And I, so, um, so I got in there and I did well and I ended up, um, hanging out with, uh, (laughs) the guys in Duran Duran were up there making a record and, um, Eddie money was up there and, uh, this is 1987, just around that time period. Okay. And um, I got to work on some cuts with, uh, well, um, a lot of really famous musicians. And I got to sit there and watch how the producer interacted with 
the musician, right? No better school than that. Jeez. No better school than that. And and my <laughs> my mentor was really um, he was pretty strident. He wasn't um, he didn't have a lot of patience because he thought that. If you just get obsessed with, look at my m- nice microphone, right? And right. look at my nice tape deck and look at this and look at that. Look how expensive it all is. It. He used to say all the time, well, <laughs> do you know how to use it? Anybody can buy the stuff, but it's if you know how to use it and know how to use it effectively. And right. he would play me records that were done on like a $2,000 budget that sounded better than records that were done at the record plant, right? right? So it was a very hardcore mentor. He, he he would make me listen to records. If I didn't pick up on what he was talking about, he would, you know, yell and scream at me. Was, wow. <laughs> that kind of thing. It's like that movie. What was that movie about the drummer, <clears throat> the jazz drummers? Can't remember the name of it now. But the, <laughs> the, hardcore, yeah. the hardcore teacher is beating everybody up and stuff. Yeah, yeah yeah well i mean um we went to shows we went to the first masters of reality show in downtown in manhattan we lived nice. right there in the middle of manhattan right cool. yeah so we were going to limelight and we were going to all these places and we saw the bullshit artists the people that just you know looked good and dressed up and did cocaine and that kind of thing but right. then we ran into people who were just you know mind bending incredible players and incredible people creative artists right and uh he got a call one day from Amy Mann from that group till tuesday and she was leaving <clears throat> no the guitar player had left and the keyboard player had left till tuesday so my mentor left and he went to play keyboards for her and so he went to boston right wow okay so he told me, you know, go home, record, just don't do anything but breathe, eat, and record. And uh, so I did, and then I got a phone call that <laughs> he wanted me to drive to Boston and uh, try out for t- till Tuesday, this thing. Okay. So I drove all the way to Boston, tried out, uh, along with 200 hotshot guitar players from Manhattan and thought that I didn't have a chance, but I was the only one called back. So um, I ended up staying there in Boston and watching that whole thing that it it, eventually it melted down and she became a solo artist and she did the Marigold soundtrack, all that stuff, you know, the the Amy Mann stuff. Okay. And uh, so I got to see, I mean, I lived with her for a week, I think. And I, you know, she was full on rock star brilliant girl and she would uh, take me to coffee shops and just tell me stories about yeah people think that this is the way this is but here's what really happens you know right the, and yeah which was even more of an education so uh that kind of blew up and i um there was no till Tuesday to play with. <laughs> so I came back to North Carolina and I approached this guy who owned a studio here. He was in the very first, the very first punk rock band in North Carolina back in 79. They were called the cigarettes. His name was Byron McKay. And he was still very much a, a punk rock kind of personality. And he had a small studio. Right. And I said, well, you know, if I can get in here, uh, I think I can I can do well and all that. So the first thing that I did, uh, he heard and he just freaked out, gave me a key to the studio. He said, if there's nobody in here, then the studio is yours. Oh, wow. Right. That's a, that's a nice perk, man. <laughs> uh-huh. And, you know, we got along. And so um, I. I ran into an old friend a guy uh oddly freed he's now a kind of legendary oh yeah I know who guitar is. player yeah, he was in the black Rose. yeah and we had played on that circuit when we were kids when we were 19. Right. he was in a band called sidewinder and i was in that band that i was in so uh 
I was, you know, of course you go to, Hey, what are you doing now? And how's it going? And he said, man, I really don't want to do the, the cover thing anymore. I'm writing these songs and I really believe in it. And so we started working on it. We worked on that in that studio every time it was open and free. Um, we were there for three years, um, just working on it. Uh, that thing developed quite a bit from what it originally sounded like. Right. And um, it was good. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we had the same old developmental problems that uh, a lot of bands have. There had to be some people uh, weeded out and all of that and the same old story. But uh, in the end, um, got the right lineup and um so it was great and everything well the guys in corrosion of conformity heard the stuff i was doing with him and <clears throat> they came over to the studio okay and they were like man we cannot believe you're getting that kind of a sound out of this it you'd laugh if you saw the studio i mean it was just a box basically right and you can do a lot with a box though you know you can. Um, there's actually a lot of stuff on the COC albums and the uh, the DAG albums that we did there, you know. Uh, so they came in and talked to me and said, look, man, you know, we <laughs> we have a problem. We want to bust out of what we're doing. We don't want to play just punk rock gigs anymore. We've been doing that since we were 16. Right. And uh, we want to get into some of these larger venues and play this more aggressive Black Sabbath kind of driven rock. And uh, but we want to maintain our punk rock credibility. We don't want to sound like we just, you know, that we're schizophrenic. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I said, OK, um, well, what do you need to do? And they said, well, can you leave Saturday <laughs> for New York? We want you to meet the label and everything. So I went with them and that got all, all the way through. And we, um, scheduled it and recorded it and did it. And that was that record blind right. that, uh, that the first one that I did with them. They seem to have between, between blind and deliverance. It seemed like the songs were definitely, they were definitely taking a turn in the songwriting style as you kind of touched on before, but what, what fundamentally changed, I guess, was that just Pep just taking over the vocals? <clears throat> did he take over more of a role as far as the songwriting process went? Well, uh, we kind of made a decision that we weren't going to rule out things because of a preconceived notion that some somehow if there's a ZZ Top reference, that that's breaking some sort of punk rock Bible that somebody wrote somewhere. Yeah, and uh, and I said, well, good because right. that that means our options are endless now. Right. right. I mean, I mean that is punk rock, really. You know, I I think. Yeah. I'm kind of mixing it up a little bit, challenging the audience. You know. <clears throat> yeah, it was. You know, they they really wanted to really go for it because "Vote with a Bullet" had been such a success off of the Blind record, and. Pepper is an endless fountain of incredible ideas. Right. He's never going to run out of that. So uh, he came to me and said, man, do you think we could pull this off, this, 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 and, and how are they getting this sound on this record and that thing? And what if we married the two things that seemed that they're unlike, but what would happen? So we did that and we put it all together and suddenly um, Columbia Records comes around just hearing some, just a couple of, you know, not even mixes, just a couple of tracks. Right. And they heard that and they consumed the entire uh, little label that they were on and got rid of all the other bands except for COC. They did all of that just to get corrosion of conformity because they were so impressed with oh wow the yeah. beginning tracks you know that, i mean when i hear you talk like that it's just like this kind of stuff just doesn't happen anymore you know if we're rock and roll bands like corrosion conformity or anybody we'd ever love you know that's an amazing story Jeez. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the punk rock thing is fantastic, and it was a, a something that was of its time. Right. And if they had been doing it in in the '90s, all through the mid and late '90s, it would have looked foolish you know they, right, right. <laughs> that was something that happened in 83 84 you know and everybody knew that so they had to evolve or it was just going to sound like man you guys are doing the same magic tricks that you did you know, 12 years ago and that's just not going to appeal too much right. so so what what he wanted what he wanted to play some guitar he wanted to play some solos and and go for it he loved thin lizzie he right. loved uh he loved santana he loved all these guitar players he never got a chance to do any of that in the, the previous iterations of right. coc yeah that makes total sense. yeah because i mean <coughs> just ripping out the entire time how was the band in the studio did they cut pretty much live or did they did they do the drums and then layer over i mean i'm sure they were well versed in the studio by then i mean and you know so a, a, a monster drummer like reed you know i bet he was i can only imagine him in the studio what was what was the band dynamic like when they were recording did they keep it more of a, a live feel do you think because that's how they sound that's how the rec all the records really sound to me well we would do we'd do both and all of it um there was never a method that just we did it the same exact way every time. We never did that. Some songs we wrote as we were going. recording the song, you know, and then some songs uh, had been rehearsed, except for maybe the lead vocal and the solos or whatever, um, but not, <clears throat> there was never any kind of, um, let's limit ourselves to a certain form and and do it that way every time we always um we had ideas coming out of pepper and everybody constantly and sometimes i mean i remember i woke up one morning and um i heard woody playing some little guitar thing and he was just waking up and <clears throat> looking out the window and i walked out and i said what is that and he said uh oh i don't know i'm just fooling around with it so i said well let's let's take that in and do something with it right right by that afternoon it was just a cool segue piece called mano de mono and very familiar um he <laughs> you know he he really liked that kind of immediacy that uh you know it happened so damn quickly yeah but um Reed was more meticulous because <clears throat> Reed was always for my money the most inventive drummer of that whole decade that 90s decade where he uh he managed somehow to play something that implied a groove that you've heard before maybe but he would do it just differently enough that it would become his own and um just capable of anything i mean this is when he was uh before the back injuries and the uh, knee injuries and all of this stuff happened to him right when he was just he was supersonic he couldn't be stopped yeah i think uh, the first time i saw the band was in 1994 in cleveland and i was always blown away by reed man we were just like what is this guy doing he was yeah you're right he was very unique very just one of a kind kind of lightning in the bottle and uh you know i i'm a drummer too so i I'm always wondering how these how these you know big players like record their tracks usually did they ever do like this is kind of a boring question but i'm just it's just for my curiosity did, did he ever use did he ever do the click track thing or did they just kind of click in and go for it oh no no um the aesthetic with a band like this is basically you're uh, you're dealing with pirates, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and if you uh, if you go against their sort of invisible code, then you will be fired, and you will have to walk the plank, and that's that, right? right? And then the thing, the reason why we got along, and I mean, I I think I was their producer for thirty years, right. and 
the reason we got along was because uh, we never entertained the idea that the ideas were going to run out or any idea was not going to be entertained. We we entertained every single idea and tried to make it work. No matter no matter how wacky it was, <laughs> it was. Right. Um, one time on Blind, uh, we were trying to duplicate the sound of a forest fire. And Pepper said, "Hey, what if I take <laughs> what if I take the uh, the cellophane off of these cigarettes and I crumple it in things and uh, in the microphone and we just do things like whoosh, and make wind sounds, right? Right. right. Which sounded immediately comic. It sounded everybody died laughing because it sounded like two guys with a cigarette wrapper <laughs> yeah, right. making really lame wind sounds." <laughs> Put but uh, on it, you know, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. So we we would do that. We would try. God, I mean, we would we we really would try everything. But the uh, that's because a lot of people don't give intellectual credit to bands that play harder music. They think that they're all um, cavemen with low SAT scores or something. And right. Uh, the funny thing about corrosion of conformity was the intelligence level. All those guys are like straight A, you know, could have gone to any college they wanted to. Uh, when Reed was going to quit high school, the governor tried to talk him out of it yeah. because he was such a scholastic wonder. And so they were really in, in, in super intelligent guys. Mike Dean is super intelligent, and Woody is. And Pepper is. So we just got along that way where we wouldn't argue. Like you hear less intelligent bands like, I don't know if you've heard that eight minute recording of the Trogs that did Wild Thing trying to um, record the follow up song to that. And they argue, <laughs> they argue for eight minutes and it sounds exactly like Spinal Tap. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> and so we never had that problem because everybody was Reed was really politically active. Right. Uh, Mike Dean, Mike Dean was, uh, Woody's capable of anything. And uh, of course, Pepper probably, I don't know, in five years, he'll be the mayor of new Orleans, but he, he could very well be, they should, they should have <laughs> that, that man to do that. I was, oh, another question. I, maybe you know, or don't know, or maybe you're wondering too, but why do you think, it is that Pepper has not done a solo album yet. I mean, that guy is capable, like you said, of so much. And so stylistically, he's capable of so much. He could do like a, he, that dude could probably do a country album if he wanted to. Why yeah, he could. He, why do he you could. think he hasn't done that yet? Uh, well, he's pulled away by um, very genuine things, obviously his daughter. And then before that, yeah. um, you know, that, that kind of thing. But uh, before that, even. Uh, he was so excited about um, Down and he gets called from uh, quite a few people to do side projects, a lot of a lot of Louisiana folks. Right. And so I don't think he's, I don't think there's enough time in his schedule, although I, I'm sure he will. I hope so. But it's just, it's going to be the time that he chooses to do it. But I think he... Uh, he bought a bar um, in New Orleans, the Bon Ton, right? That everybody right. knows, and and he uh, he really likes that community, and I think he likes being a part of the heritage part of the the New Orleans community. Right. So, yeah, I think all of those things take him away from, you know doing even more than he does he does quite a bit <laughs> yeah that's cool man i mean yeah i would just wonder but uh yeah <clears throat> i, I kind of took that he he seems like he's uh he's he's elusive because he's not on social media or anything so it's kind of hard to, to tell what that guy's up to all the time but aside from down and corrosion but i mean the the newest album no cross no crown that although it took quite a bit of time for them to get it together it just fits in perfectly. I think it's one of their best releases, man. I think you guys together just did a phenomenal job with it. The songs are next level and it sounds fantastic. How were those sessions? Were they a little more difficult because they had been separated for so long? 
Well, they were sporadic. We had to work three, four, or five days and then take a break, and everybody had to go do whatever they had to do. Right. So it took a long time, but uh, um, we're very automatic when we work together now, so I think things get done a lot quicker. And, um, you know, there was uh, was no real... um, there was nothing to really uh, speed us up. Um, we would uh, release songs to uh, Nuclear Blast and and do the whole, um, keep them updated. Right. So everything went well that way. But it did. It took longer just because of travel, just logistics, not really anything else but that. Do you guys uh, have plans <clears throat> on doing something new? soon or is that just kind of up in the air i know they're on the I, road a ton man they're just torn like crazy which is awesome but i'm just yeah as to new material i suspect um knowing them they they would want to do something really guitar oriented um this time uh no cross no crown is an orchestrated sort of album and um i think they would probably want to do the stripped down kind of record where they just um you know lots of cool guitar work lots of uh aggression that yeah. kind of thing yeah. and uh plus they'll be just off the road after all that time they'll be they'll be lethal that way yeah excellent <clears throat> that's cool oh i had a question here's here's something that doesn't get brought up a lot which is the self-titled record that you guys did a few years ago at uh dave Grohl's studio uh studio 606 of course that board is infamous now it's been infamous but it's uh you know made more famous even by the uh, sound city uh, uh documentary which was just a masterpiece in my mind it's really very inspiring to hear that story how was it for you guys to record a record on that board it sound that record sounds phenomenal i don't think it got enough attention and i'm just just curious about that because i, I <clears> haven't <throat> got to hear any any stories about that or anything but i'm sure that was pretty cool right yeah when you walk in and see it it's like seeing the ark of the covenant you know there it is yeah and uh so yeah it was uh it was a gorgeous thing to see and that whole place is just a giant altar to all of that great music and you look on the wall and he's got signed signed pictures from Freddie Mercury and Keith Richards and all of that kind of thing so it it just it's a it's a beautiful facility and that's a very nice part of California but uh the the board itself was one of those um you used it and since you were kind of distracted by getting the idea to work right you would forget you know you'd forget that oh yeah i'm touching the board that they recorded rumors and sure. never mind on so yeah i think you'd probably take some time to <laughs> soak in the energy of the studio and then and then kind of get to work you know i imagine that's how it would be yeah that's how it went and it was just it was just good to see them back together because they hadn't played or recorded in a long time so that was great because uh from the state of north carolina they are the most significant thing to come out of this state as far as a band being more than just a band they were influential on a level that can't even you can't even begin to describe it but um, right. You know, they inspired Dave Grohl, they inspired Rage Against the Machine, and on, and the Melvins, and on, and on, and on. So Right, it was apparent, uh, you know, as soon as uh, Reed passed, because, man, I was just looking on Instagram, and every major band you could think of was posting his picture. It was just, it was yeah. mind, mind-blowing. I was like, yeah, that that's mm-hmm. right. I mean, these guys were just enormously influential on the international rock and roll and punk scene. I mean... That was without a doubt, so um, a huge loss. But um, you know, hopefully everybody's uh, we're pulling through on that one. As far as uh, 
of current projects? What are you getting into these days? Uh, I just finished an album with, uh, well, let's see. It's a band that's uh, really blowing up right now. They're called Big Something. They just did some tour dates with, uh, they did tour dates with Widespread Panic. They're from that end of the street to jam band kind of thing. Okay. But they're atypical, uh, just mind-numbingly great players, incredible players, all of them. So uh, I've been working, I've been producing them for the last 10 years, and they just did that Telluride festival. They did, oh. I mean, everything. So they're playing for thousands of people now, and it's. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not surprised because I thought... I thought this would happen, so I'm I'm happy for them. It's just they are on the road constantly, uh, except for uh, the present crisis going on. Kind of all their dates got canceled, so yeah, that's along with pretty much everyone else right now. It's kind of it's, it's yeah. a big, big drag, man. Kind of concerning, but uh, I think everybody will pull together. Hopefully, they can all get back on the road soon. We're all hoping that that can happen and uh yeah well i'll definitely check these guys out maybe we'll play a song or, or uh something at the end of this uh cheer program <laughs> and we'll uh we'll definitely check that one out man well hey i appreciate your time talking to me man this is a it's a big deal for me i've been listening to your stuff for a long time what we try to do on this podcast is kind of bring to the forefront the folks that are usually in the background of all these monolithic band so i just wanted to uh, get your name out there even further in any way well, great. well i appreciate it it's this is the kind of thing that gets uh, the good music out there moving forward a little more so absolutely and it's people it's like a you big that deal make it happen so yeah it is a big deal for all of us in the rock and roll community so uh again thank you man i appreciate it and uh stay stay healthy out there and uh if you guys need anything from us let let me know we'll uh we'll blow up we'll help blow up any any band that you're working with anyway so beautiful absolutely well thanks appreciate it man stay healthy yeah man you too you too take care see you all right